And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Wonderful, Sam, Don. Thank you very much. Will you stand as you're able for today's gospel lesson from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13? You can remain standing for the doxology to follow. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. Thank you. May be seated. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. You know, that, that's the first thing I think when I hear the reading of this particular gospel text. It really is. You see, in the secular world, my job falls under the category of religious professional. Religious professional. And so I read this story, and I see the religious professional in the story. Jesus heals a woman who has been afflicted for 18 years. And all the religious professional can do is say, no, 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 we can't have any of that. Goodness. That's why I have to confess, sometimes I pray, Lord, help me lose my religion, if that's what it means. And indeed, there's a difference. There's a difference between religion and the faith that it takes to follow Jesus Christ. Religion is sort of this human construct that often is very much concerned with power and authority. I mean, Religion can happen anywhere, right? We religiously support our sports teams. We're religious about our politics. We're religious about our opinions that are strongly held. Religious about anything. But that's different. Why? Because we're not called to follow a religion. We are called to follow a person. And that person is Jesus Christ the Lord who gave himself for you and for me. It's important to make that distinction, friends. That's why it's sometimes good to lose your religion, because it reminds us that we are called to wholeheartedly follow after a person, Jesus Christ. How can we make that distinction today? Well, first of all, religion seeks to create the right appearance but Jesus' faith creates right spirit and right hearts. Notice the religious leader of the synagogue. He was all about how this was going to appear poorly. This is bad press. You know, curing somebody is a form of work. So someone just worked on the Sabbath. That's not a good appearance. We don't want that word to get out. Shame on you. But Jesus, <laughs> he sees this woman who no doubt not only physically but emotionally and psychologically and spiritually was afflicted in so many different ways and, as he says, held in bondage, if you will. Jesus calls us, friends, to right spirit and right heart. In fact, in 1 Samuel it says, humanity looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus, in challenging the religious folk, said, you're just like whited sepulchers. You look nice and painted well on the outside, but inside you're full of dead bones. Again, the focus was upon right heart and right spirit. That's what it takes to impact our world today. Because people in the world today, they're going to know when you're just putting up a front. And sometimes that's what religion encourages. I put up a good front, I put on a suit, put on a smile, everything's good. I'm a great person and never gets to the heart of the matter, 
where God can transform the spirit and the soul. I remember a number of years ago when I was in Liberia, West Africa, with the General Board of Discipleship and going from village to village, preaching and teaching, and was up at Ganta uh, near the Guinea border. And I was there right between two very ferocious civil wars in Liberia. And the church and most of the buildings, many of them were simply shells. That's all that was left. Uh, The Civil War had destroyed everything. People find it horrendous, which it was. Even the pianos in the church were stripped of their piano wire because the piano wire was used as an instrument of death and torture. And so there it was, just the shell of a building in Ganta, the church where I would preach. And I was looking at it, and the pastor of the church, that nice Liberian English accent, said to me, upon watching me look at the church, he said, our church is strong. Our church is strong. And he noticed that I was still looking at this shell of a building. And he said, Dr. Ken, Dr. Ken, it may look like on the outside that we're not, but on the inside, and he pointed to his heart, we are strong. And that indeed was the case. Because of their heart and spirit being connected to the living God in Jesus Christ, they were able to persevere and make it through things that none of us have had to face in terms of uh, horrific types of tragedies. Because their heart and their spirits were right, connected to God, they were making an impact amidst the ruins of a civil war. And so, friends, we are called to follow Jesus Christ We allow him to create within us right spirits and right hearts so that we can impact the world on his behalf. We're called to follow the person, Jesus Christ. That's why it's good to lose your religion. Secondly, religion focuses on broken rules, but Jesus' faith focuses on broken people. Notice the story again. This devout religious leader of the synagogue. All he could point out was the fact that a rule had been broken. The commandment says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. You cured somebody on the Sabbath, you worked, you broke a rule. He was in, the Bible even says he was indignant. It, it is tragically humorous to me. <laughs> because he, look, look at the sins in the scripture. He says, you know, there are six days that you could have come and been healed. Why do you have to do this on the Sabbath day? Goodness gracious. Yeah, the the holiest of days. We wouldn't want God to act on that day, would we? He was so caught up with the broken rule that he couldn't see the broken person right in front of him. But that's the one that Jesus saw. And he healed, made her whole and set her free. That's the difference. You've heard me talk about, I've shared before, my father was a milkman. He delivered milk in Richwood, West Virginia to grocery stores and restaurants for over 30 years. And back at that time when you came of age, about 12 years old, 11, 12 years old, uh, I went with my father on the milk truck to help him. Every summer on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, those were my days, 5 a.m., up and at him, out the door. Even during the school year, all the way through my high school year, Saturday morning, 5 a.m., up and at him, out the door. I now look back and treasure those times, though at the time, uh, getting up at 5 o'clock as a teenager wasn't exactly high on my list. But he loved to hear me tell. In fact, I shared it at his funeral because it was an important moment in our relationship in general. The restaurants at the time had milk dispensers behind the counter, and those milk dispensers held big six-gallon cardboard containers of milk. That's how they dispensed the milk. And so it was quite a, a great moment when my dad at one of the restaurants one morning said to me, go out in the milk truck and get a six-gallon. That meant he thought I was strong enough to handle this large amount of uh, container of milk. And so I went out, I got the rest of the six-gallon out of the truck, I brought it in, there were already some breakfast customers sitting there in the restaurant, I went behind the counter, I opened up the milk dispenser, I took out the empty one, I took that heavy six-gallon of milk and I hoisted it up to the dispenser and I put it in and it, my hand got stuck underneath the box. And so I just 
pulled my hand out suddenly. And when I did, the nozzle came with my hand. And milk began to gush out on top of me, out into the floor. The milk ran around the counter, out into the restaurant where the customers were eating. They all started laughing. I was humiliated, right? I'll never forget, my dad came out. He heard the commotion. He was in the back. And he looked at me in the milk. And he saw the customers laughing. And then he said, just loud enough for them to hear. You know, that happened to me one time. Let's get a mop and clean it up. All of a sudden, my humiliation went away. The customers stopped laughing. Oh, the regular guy that's been here 30 years, that must be something that happens. I look back at that as an important moment because my father could have pointed out my mess and he could have pointed out how I had failed in my first attempt at doing this but he didn't instead of looking at the mess I'd made he looked at my heart and he knew what I was feeling and he offered a word that would take care of that in that moment do you see the difference You know, we got back in the milk truck after that and went on to the next stop. And as we're driving along, I said, Dad, did that really happen to you? He never answered me. He just kept driving. (laughs) And I don't know if it did or not to this day, but it didn't matter. Because he knew the word that was needed was a word to the heart. And I've prayed at times, help me see it with my father's eyes. Because religion is always wanting to point out the mess that people have made the rules that they've broken, the failures that they've had. And they offer no solution. They just like to point it out. But faith in Jesus Christ, those who follow Jesus, we look to the broken people in our midst and the broken hearts and try to lift them up. That's the difference. Friends, we need to be about this in our world today because in our world today and and religion in general, When it comes to to using our hand, for example, oftentimes religion is about the pointed finger. The hand is used as a pointed finger. Ah, look at those people. They, boy, they've really messed up. Look. But what followers of Jesus, what Jesus needs his followers to do is not use the hand as a pointed finger, but to use the hand as a lever and reach people and lift them up. Reach out. Hold their hand. Lift them up, encourage them, build them up. Religion focuses on broken rules. Followers of Jesus focus on broken people. That's why it's good to lose your religion. Third, religion asks, what's in it for me? Jesus' faith asks, how can I serve you today? Religion wants to make it about us. In fact, many times in the church, in all denominations, oftentimes church has become sort of a a consumer transaction. If I don't get something out of it, it must be of no value. If I don't get something out of it, then it must be of no value. That's a very self-centered view of the realm of religion. And oftentimes we're sort of taught that almost. Well, you need to get something out of it. So what's in it for you? But followers of Jesus, they're about the service. And Jesus tries to point out that error at the end. Shouldn't this woman be set free? Shouldn't someone serve her regardless of what day it is? Shouldn't someone serve her and set her free? And he was the one to do that in that that instance. Shouldn't this be happening? And it says all of them were put to shame and everyone else praised God for the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. The way Jesus does wonderful things today is when his people decide to get outside of themselves and serve in his name in the world. That's what it takes. When I was serving at Wesley United Methodist Church in Morgantown, one weekend the youth group was in charge of preparing the meal and serving the meal for Bartlett House. Bartlett House in Morgantown is the homeless shelter and feeding ministry there, much like our Clarksburg mission or something like that. And I remember I put a word out to the youth, you know, we're going to be 
meeting there to serve uh, at the Bartlett House and heard back from a 14-year-old girl. She got back with me, and she was a part of some club at school, and she said, well, our club is going to Kennywood Park that day. I might not be able to make it. I said, okay, I understand. You know, I'm easy. At, things happen and so forth. Well, <laughs> just shortly thereafter, her mom calls me. It says, well, you may have heard her club's going to Kennywood Park. She might not be able, yeah, I, I heard, no problem. No, you don't, <laughs> you don't understand, preacher. I said, what's that? She said, I, I've told her this is actually a more important decision than she may seem, than may seem to her. But I'm leaving the decision entirely to her. Okay, thank you for calling. We went to the Bartlett House that Saturday. We started preparing the meal. And in walks this 14-year-old girl. She jumped in, started helping us prepare the meal, and we served it. There we sat down with the folk and ate at table with them. She stayed, helped us clean up. And I thought about it then, and I, I knew the answer already, but it's just one of those reflection moments, yes? I thought to myself, you know, what is going to form and shape her more? Going to Kennywood? or serving at the homeless shelter? And I knew the answer already, but it was just one of those moments. And I still think about that every now and then. You see, the mom was right. It was a more important decision than the young person probably realized at the time. Because it was a decision of whether to go with self-interest or service. That's an important decision for everyone. And I often think, you know, that's been over 20 years ago. This young lady's probably in her mid-30s at least by now. What happened? Well, I'll bet. You know, I'll bet that she's still serving somewhere. I really do. I have no idea where she is in the nation or in the world. She may even be the leader of a youth group and taking them on a mission trip or taking them over to feed at a homeless shelter by now. She probably has kids of her own that she's trying to impress upon the need for serving Christ. I don't know that for sure, but there's a good chance. All because of one seemingly small decision to choose service over self. Friends, religion asks, what's in it for me? Followers of Jesus ask, as he did, how can I serve today? That's why it's good to lose your religion. Let us pray. Lord, oftentimes in our society, it's easy to prefer self over anything else. Self-interest, self-pursuit, our own agendas. But then along comes Jesus. He challenges. He comforts. He strengthens. He encourages. Because, Lord, we know what we're called to do and who we're called to be, but we cannot do that of our own power. And so today we pray as we come to Jesus that you would give us the wisdom to surrender all things into his hands. Surrender our hearts, our souls, our lives, our service, our activities, our calendars, that we surrender all of those into his hands and let him shape and mold and work in us. And as he does, oh God, make us attentive to what we hear. In his holy name we pray. Amen.